Good evening and welcome to Empower You. <laughs> I'm glad so many, I'm still loud. I'm glad to see so many of you out here tonight since it's turned cold outside. Um, I'm Betty Overstreet. I'm the, I forget what I am, but I'm the Community Relations Director. I always have to think about that. <laughs> Um, empower you. You got to get that, huh? I know. We're working on it. I can't talk if I have to hear myself. Okay. Um, sorry, for those of you online, we're trying to get the sound working right. You can't hear me online. Okay. Oh, I think we're fixed. <laughs> Again, I'm Betty Overstreet, the Community Relations Director. Empower You started um, eight years ago in 2011, was founded by, by Dan Reganol, who is also the founder and CEO of Frame USA, which you're in for a treat tonight because he's going to be your speaker. Um, just want to let you know that most of our classes are live streamed, so if any time you can't get to a class, you can log in online about 10 minutes before the class and watch it. And if you um, miss a class and want to see it later, we do post them on the website within a day or two, so you can always go back and look at it later. We also welcome any feedback that you might have, uh, good or bad, and we also welcome any suggestions you might have for future classes. Some of our classes do come about from our participants, so we are always grateful to have your ideas. Towards the end of our class, we will pass around our donation buckets. We do um, run this organization only by donations, so it's only by people like you who are so wonderful to contribute that keep us going. And also, uh, when you have a question tonight, if you would raise your hand and wait for uh, someone to bring a microphone to you so that everybody in the room can hear your question and those of onli online can also hear your question. And those of you online can also submit questions. Next, I just want to thank our volunteers that are here tonight. Uh, Jill Google in the back is our operations manager. Uh, Jay Gronke, who is our producer with the sound back there, and thank you for getting the microphone fixed. We also have Ken Bowman, one of our board members in the studio. So I'd like to, at this time, ask Nita Thomas, our executive director, to come up. Well, thank everyone for coming this evening. And um, hello and thank you to everyone that's online. I'd like to just talk about a few classes that are coming up. Our class next Tuesday is going to be on the history of the Roebling Suspension Bridge. And probably most people are pretty familiar with some of that history, how Roebling is the one who talked New York into building their bridge. He said they could do it. And when we put this class online, we got a letter from someone, or an email, who said she had a letter that her grandmother had written her mother <clears throat> about the Roebling Bridge. And when they were constructing it, her grandmother wanted to walk across it. And the construction workers didn't want her to. They weren't quite done. And they said something like women's head were full of air or, or something, I don't know, whatever they said back then. So just to prove them wrong, she walked across the bridge with her arms outstretched and not holding on. <laughs> and I'm hoping this woman comes and tells that story, story and shares the letter with us. I thought that was wonderful. And knowing this woman, I can tell you the apple didn't fall far from the tree. <laughs> And the next one will be on the electrical grid 
vulnerabilities, okay, in Cincinnati. And I know we all have blinks of electricity going out, maybe even hours of electricity going out, but what if we really have a real outage for a long time? So this should be very interesting and maybe think you a little about, about being prepared if that happens and what are the possibilities of that happening? Because most of the time you really don't think about it's electrics usually just working, but it is something you might want to take into consideration, especially with winter coming. And the last one <clears throat> is um, An Evening with Abraham Lincoln. Stan Wurtz is a Abraham Lincoln, I guess you'd say impersonator, but really he, you think you, you're witnessing Abraham Lincoln when he talks. He takes us his persona. He is amazing. I've seen him twice, maybe three times, but I never tire of it. The, the man is just amazing and, and it's well worth it if you can make that one. So, um, the next thing I'd like to do is the door prize, but I didn't bring the tickets. Oh, somebody brought the tickets up for me. <laughs> okay, the number is 2479. All right, we have a winner here. And what you have here is a book by Charles Krauthammer on things that matter. Okay, so now I would like to introduce Dan Reginald, our incredible founder who made everything in this studio possible. And um, he can introduce himself because I couldn't do it justice. So <laughs> here's Dan. <laughs> Your name is Jerry Anders. So let's give Jerry Anders our winner a round of applause tonight. So a couple things I wanted to go over with you. Welcome. It's so good to see you. It's good to see, I think, 15 people logged on um, to our website tonight. We're trying some new technology tonight with a lot of Charles videos we're going to be playing. So. Hope it works great, everybody. Um, so Dave, uh, one of our frequent Empower You guests, was kind enough to lend me this video. Has anybody seen it, Won't You Be My Neighbor? I really recommend it. Um, it was such a great divergence from pol watching politics at night uh, because it was just so radically different um, how Mr. Rogers, in all those years, my kids didn't really watch him. They watched you know, Big Bird and Ernie and stuff like that. but. It was such a refreshing movie about his approach uh, on life, and I really want to thank um, Dave for lending me this. And the movie uh, website that I used to decide if I'm going to go to movies are not rated at like 83 out of 100. I'd say it was about the same thing. If you ever get a good family movie. So thanks, Dave. Thanks for lending that to me. Um, I passed that article. I don't know if you got it. If you didn't, you can get it at the door. Um, it's Wall Street Journal. It was in yesterday's paper called... Trump's healthcare progress. This doesn't really have anything to do with Trump, I didn't think, but so much of the election was banked on um, healthcare. And whether it was working or whether it wasn't working, here's a totally diametrically opposed piece on some of the stuff that's going on with healthcare. And I encourage you to read it, it's pretty, a pretty good read. And finally, I would tell you this Gettysburg Address. Did any of you come to Glendale five years ago for the 150th anniversary when we did this? Anybody? Jude was there. So one of the things Charles is going to talk about tonight, most of tonight is going to be in his words, not mine, which you'll all appreciate. He talks about the, the, the so much of our education has been, become gender, misogyny, uh, things that aren't important to mathematics, to history, to lessons. And if there was ever a case where you had kids that were your grandkids or your children, or that you knew somebody that had kids, you should bring them to this. This event will be like Abraham Lincoln visiting here. It'll be like he's in the building. He's so much better than a um, impersonator. He's incredible. That will be the 19th. Is that... Is that a Monday, Monday night? So that 
Tuesday night. So it's a week from this Tuesday. So if you get a chance, if you know somebody, there's some flyers at the back, take them and invite your, uh, your, 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 your kids and friends to come. So let's get into tonight's presentation. Um, it is a Monday night. Thank you. Thank you for that. So we're going to remember Charles Krauthammer tonight. Um, I kind of entitled the session, What Do You Believe? One of his quotes that I really liked was, You're you are betraying your whole life if you don't say what you think. Next time you're in a situation where you're trying to decide if you want to say what you think or not, it's easy to, to not say what you think. I want you to remember what Charles said because he spent his whole life doing that. So is Susan Eichel here tonight? It, maybe she's online. If you are, thanks, Susan, for sponsoring the class. We really appreciate it. So I'm going to steal a quote from Neil Cavuto. Um, as viewer, I was a voyeur. That's the reason I wanted to do this class tonight, because constantly, whenever I would, um, whenever I'd be doing something and Charles would come on, I immediately felt like I had to go watch it. I'm getting a little feedback. So let me see if I can just figure out how to turn the, be able to do that. Um, so, and in my family, um, you know, when my wife would be talking to me and Charles would come on, you know, I'd kind of pretend I was listening to what she had to say, but I really wanted to hear what he had to say because I judged a lot about what I believed based on what he said. Not that I believed what he said, but I judged my beliefs against his. I knew he was much smarter than I was. So if I had to um, kind of formulate or change my beliefs, I really always wanted to hear what Charles um, said about things. So I was kind of a, um, a voyeur of him. Um, and so the thesis for tonight is you're going to hear so many of his views on things. You're going to walk away with 30. He's going to tell you 30 things of what he believes. My thesis to you is, can Charles convince you to change any of your views and beliefs? When you walk out the door, are you going to be able to raise your hand and say, well, he may this or this differently. I don't know. Probably a lot of the views may that when we um, some of the material for tonight. So what we're going to be doing tonight look, and looking at what Charles believed through his own words via video. We're also going to learn you, Ernest, there's some of my, my favorite essays, some of yours, of things that he believed. And what I tried to do was pick things that would show a wide range of thought he wasn't a guy that just talked about politics. He talked about the world, all aspects of it. I mean, he, he talked about things like stem cells. He talked about things like astronauts. He talked about things like, um, that, that, like chess. He was a big chess lover. He was a huge fan of baseball. He loved baseball. Um, so let me give you uh, a good kind of barometer. And what we're going to do is we're going to start off with a few notable quotables from Charles Krauthammer. Notable quotables, Charles Krauthammer style. Let me give a piece of advice. When there's a suit between the Leviathan state of Obama against the little sisters of the poor, take the side of the little sisters of the poor. Great. I have a soft spot. It could be because I was in my youth a liberal. Yes. I retain that the marshmallow deep inside my heart. The pity is this. This is the strongest field of Republican candidates. And instead, all our time is spent discussing this rodeo clown. I'm the best president I've ever been. That's a pretty low bar. This is what it sounds like when you're living in a banana republic. Every time liberals lose, they accuse the other side of all kinds of isms. The world is going to hell in a handbasket. It'll snow in hell before uh, the DOJ is going to go after her. Hyde 
Sean Spicer uh, Witness Protection Program somewhere in Iowa, I think, would help, and take away the president's tweeting machine drunk. You've and, been through and I, Wine, Women, and Song, I, I opioids. Seem, I seem to have started the trend. The only other option is an act of God, and he appears to be otherwise occupied right now. And we'll hope the video gets a little better. It's the first time I've seen it kind of not match, so we'll keep our fingers crossed on that. So I said this about, uh, this is one of Charles' quotes I really like. Politics is the moat, the walls behind which lie the barbarians. If you fail to keep them at bay, everything burns. And um, I used um, uh, um, an analogy that even when we don't want to think about politics, because we get tired of talking about it, we're tired of the election, it's amazing that if you don't keep your guard up, how quickly things can change. And that is what he is really suggesting here. He also went on to say that John is the foundation from which you must secure life, liberty, and the right to pursue your own happiness. He said that's politics done right. He also went on to say that Adam says, and I know you I know you've heard this before from probably some other talks. There was never a democracy that did not commit suicide. Therefore, Charles says, politics is important. Let's not commit suicide. Let's talk about his history. He was born in 1950. He was a conservative political pundit. In 1987, Krauthammer won the Pulitzer Prize for his column in the Washington Post, published in 400 newspapers. In his first year at Harvard, he became permanently paralyzed from his waist down after a diving board accident. He spent 14 months recovering. He went to college to be a doctor. His family, his, his family was comprised of doctors, but when he got into college, he didn't like it, and he decided he wanted to be a psychiatrist. And he joined the Carter administration in 1978 as a director of psychiatric research. And in 1980, this is where he becomes very interesting, he became a speechwriter to Vice President Walter Mondale. In 85, he began writing a weekly editorial for the Washington Post. In 1990, he became a panelist on PBS's new program, Inside Washington. He was a weekly contributor to the Weekly Standard. And in 2013, he probably joined what you're most familiar seeing him with when he, when he joined Fox News as a contributing, um, editor to Fox News Channel special with Brett Baer. Um, I think that, that he holds most important in reading his book is his interpretation of foreign policy. Foreign policy, I'm not gonna cover a ton tonight other than maybe spice a couple things. Really, he coined the term Reagan doctrine. He was a real hawk. He believed in the United States where it needed to protecting itself and uh, using its muscle in the Gulf and Iran wars. In 2017, to, due to his battle with cancer, he stopped writing his column and he died just six months. He was often asked, how do you go from working for Walter Mondale to being on Fox News? Now that's a pretty big um, but he said the short answer was, I was young once. I was a lifelong Democrat and in my youth a great society liberal, but I'd always identified with the party's Cold War liberals. However, when the Democratic liberals went further left in the 1980s and reflexively opposed every element of Reagan's foreign policy, I realized that I couldn't save the soul of the Democratic Party. The Cold War contingent on the Democratic Party disappeared. Patrick Moynihan couldn't pick up the mantle. I didn't leave the Democratic Party. It left me. And he said, as I became convinced of the practical defects of the Democratic tendencies of my youth, it was but a short distance to a life of restrained free market governments that gave space and place to the individual that stands between citizen and state. I found my eventual political home in the vision of limited government that while providing for the helpless is committed above all to guaranteeing individual liberty. I think a good place to start discussing Charles Krauthammer is one of his essays on the Constitution. I just felt that was a good place to start. Here's what he says. The Constitution is a document that speaks. Nothing in our public life 
is more substantive than the U.S. Constitution. Judicial originalists, led by Antonin Scalia, insist that legal interpretation be bound by the text of the Constitution. Our friends on the left believe in, a, in the living Constitution, under which high courts are channelers of the spirit of the age, free to create new principles of the Constitution. Krauthammer says, the real test for Republicans will come in legislating. Will Republicans really cut government spending? Will libertarians really cut, really cut government spending? Will they roll back regulations? Do Republicans have the courage to go after entitlements? Constitutionalism will require careful and thoughtful development, but its wide appeal and philosophical depth make it a promising first step to a great future. Anything that reminds members of Congress that they are not free agents is salutary. Let's talk about Charles' impact on journalism. This is a video from Howard Kurtz. Charles Krauthammer was a powerful voice at this network, but it was in his writing for the Washington Post and Time Magazine that he may have had his greatest impact on the journalism business. Left-wing commentators viewed him with admiration, and for those like liberal post-columnist Gene Robertson writing on the same subject, a little nervousness. I'd always um, give it another, my columns, <laughs> another read or two because I knew that, that Charles would attack, you know, he would, would sort of pre-attack all the weak points in the argument and, 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 and pick them apart. He fits into a tradition, if you think about people like Bill Buckley, and what Bill Buckley meant for conservative thought in this country. Then you come to people like Bill Sapphire, who came out of the Nixon administration. He began as a Walter Mondale speechwriter and a New Republic writer before his views evolved. It was Krauthammer the wordsmith who coined the phrase Bush derangement syndrome for that president's fiercest critics. And Krauthammer who defined President Reagan's foreign policy. He invented the Reagan doctrine, not Reagan. It codified uh, what a lot of sort of amorphous feelings that people on the right had. Krauthammer took plenty of flack for his steadfast support for the Iraq war and was very tough on President Obama. Yet he was equally comfortable taking swipes at Hillary Clinton. What she needs are lying lessons from her husband, who was one of the great liars of all time, could do it with a smile and charm. And at Donald Trump. Presidents don't talk like this. They never have. This is what it sounds like when you're living in a banana republic. But he occasionally praised President Trump as well. As New York Times columnist Brett Stevens said, the game for him was philosophical, not partisan. His conservatism was never about getting Republicans elected. He ranged widely as a writer from his beloved baseball to a cheeky column called In Defense of the F Word. He dictated his columns because he was unable to type, but rarely spoke of his disability. You're betraying your whole life if you don't say what you think and you don't say it honestly and bluntly. Charles could be blunt, but he was never nasty, a marked contrast to today's angry, outraged, name-calling brand of punditry. He was trained as a medical doctor, but he used a scalpel, not a sledgehammer, uh, to uh, go after his targets. And in that sense, Brett, he lifted everyone's game. It's so different to hear somebody not have to rely on the volume of their voice uh, to get their point across. It's such a welcome thing. I found this really an interesting essay that he wrote on Winston Churchill. He called him the indispensable man. I'll, sh I'll share just a bit with you. It's just a parlor game, but since it only happens once every hundred years, it's hard to resist. Who was the person of the century in the, in the 20th century? Time Magazine said it was Albert Einstein. Einstein was an interesting, solid choice. Unfortunately, it's wrong. The only possible answer is Winston Churchill. Why? Because only Churchill carries that absolutely required criterion, indispensability. Winston, without Winston Churchill, the world today would be unrecognizable. It would be dark, impoverished, tortured. Einstein was certainly the best mind of the century. In 1905, he published the photoelectric effect and the special theory on relativity, which is probably the single most concentrated display of genius since the invention of the axle. But if you take away Churchill in 1940, on the other hand, Britain would have settled with Hitler or worse. Nazism would have prevailed. Hitler would have achieved what no other tyrant, even Napoleon, 
had ever achieved, mastery of Europe. This is something we would never forget. Civilization would have descended into darkness the likes of which it has never known. Who was the person of the 20th century? Yes, it was many great leaders, FDR, De Gaulle, Truman, John Paul II, Thatcher, Reagan, but above all, it required Winston Churchill. And the evolution of Charles Krauthammer, when I, was, when I was, was looking at him, was just so interesting from being Carter and Mondale to how much of a libertarian he became. And one of my favorite essays of his was called, Don't Touch My Junk. Um, we pretend, here's what it says. We pretend that when we go through this nonsense of being checked for security at the airport, that it's a small price to pay. Rubbish. This has nothing to do with safety at all. 95% of these inspection searches, shoe removals, pat downs, you're thinking about it now, are ridiculously unnecessary. The only reason we continue to do this is that people are too cowed to even question the absurd tattoo taboo against profiling. When the profile of the airline attracker, attract attacker is narrow, concrete, definable, and universally known. So instead of seeking out terrorists, we seek out tubes of hair gel in strollers and pouches. The docile public, that's us, declare that it would tolerate, would, will tolerate only so much idiocy. Metal detector, back of the hand pat, okay. We'll swallow hard and pretend airline attackers are randomly distributed in the population, which they aren't. But now you insist on a full body scan, a fairly accurate representation of my naked body to be viewed by a total stranger. Or alternatively, the full body pat down, which as most people have noted, would be sexual assault if performed by anyone else. Imagine the Me Too movement. This time you've gone too far, big bro. The sleeping giant awakes. You can take my shoes, remove my belt, waste my time and try my patience, but don't touch my junk. Um, and if you think about it, isn't he so right? And why are we so dumb? Um, gosh, when I, when I went through mountains of videos, I like to talk about subjects that interest me, and this is such an interesting guy. I, I mean, when he talked about climate change, um, it, just, it just was so clear. I'm not impressed with numbers. I'm not impressed with consensus. This is what he says. An inclination upon some to doubt the science, despite the overwhelming evidence and the uh, overwhelming percentage in the 97% range of scientists who study this issue who agree uh, that uh, climate change is real and that uh, it is the result of uh, human activity. Charles. 99% of physicists were convinced that space and time are fixed until Einstein, working at a patent office, wrote a paper in which he showed that they are not. I'm not impressed by numbers. I'm not impressed by consensus. I, when, when I was a psychiatrist, I participated in consensus conferences on how to define a depression and mania. These are things that people negotiate in the way you would negotiate a bill because the science is unstable because in the case of climate, the models are changeable. And because climate is so complicated, the idea that we who have trouble forecasting what's gonna happen on Saturday in the climate could pretend to, to be predicting what's gonna happen in 30, 40 years is absurd. And you always see that no matter what happens, whether it's a flood or it's a drought, uh, whether it's one that's warming or cooling, it's always a result of what is ultimately what we're talking about here, human sin with, with pollution of carbon. It's the oldest superstition around. It was in the Old Testament. It's in the rain dance of Native Americans. If you sin, the skies will not cooperate. This is quite superstitious, and I'm waiting for science which doesn't declare itself definitive, but is otherwise convincing. Okay.
If global warming is a problem, why are we having such a tough winter? Well, Al Gore told Gail Collins of the New York Times there's about a 4% more water vapor now in the atmosphere than there was in the 70s because of warmer oceans and warmer air, and it returns to Earth as heavy rain and heavy snow. That's Look, what Al Gore if Godzilla appeared on the mall this afternoon, Al Gore would say it's global warming <laughs> because the spores of the South Atlantic Ocean... <laughs> You know, we're, look, it, it, everything is, it, it's a religion. In a religion, everything is explicable. In science, you can actually deny or falsify a proposition with evidence. You, you find me a single piece of evidence that Al Gore would ever admit would well, contradict Al, global warming, and I'll be Al, surprised. Al a, a How many of you would love to be able to just kind of, next time that subject comes up, just kind of go into that discussion, just as straightforward to see, it wouldn't be fun. Um, so this, this was kind of a, um, just, I think this showed a lot of Krauthammer's humanity. Um, it was an essay, a short essay called Of Dogs and Men. I must admit that I've been slow to warm to dogs. I grew up in a non-pet friendly home. Dogs do not figure prominently in Jewish immigrant households. My father was not high on pets. He wouldn't allow us to have them. When my son turned 10, he wanted a dog of his own. I was against it, using arguments borrowed from seminars on nuclear non-proliferation. -prolifer it was hopeless. One giant pleased dad and I caved completely. My wife went and found a litter of black labs and brought home Chester. Chester is what psychiatrists mean when they talk about unconditional love. Unbridled is more like it. If you come into our house, Chester was so happy to see you, he would knock you over. Delivery men learned to leave things at the front door. Then about a month ago, at the tender age of eight, Chester died quite suddenly. When told the news, a young friend who was a regular victim to Chester's lunging love bomb said mournfully, he was the sweetest creature I ever saw. He's the only dog I ever saw kiss a cat. Some will protest that in a world with so much human suffering, it is something between eccentric and obscene to mourn a dog. I think not. After all, it is perfectly normal, indeed deeply human, to be moved when nature presents us with a vision of such great beauty. Should we not be moved with it when it produces a vision, a creature of the purest sweetness? And, uh, this is probably one of the, has, has anybody ever heard of, heard of this, this essay before in defense of the F word? Um, this is like one of his most famous essays. And I kind of remembered it. It might take you back to some, a few years back uh, when Washington was abuzz with the latest political contretemps, Dick Cheney, Dick Cheney took offense at Senator Pat Leahy's imputation of his conduct regarding Halliburton. And, he, and Cheney let the senator know so much during a picture-taking ceremony on the floor of the Senate. The F word was used. The newspapers were full of it. The Washington Post gave special gravitas to the occasion, spelling out the full four letters. The vice president remained defying. Cheney said, yes, I probably cursed. I may have expressed myself forcefully, he said. Reporters have not quite resolved the issue of which of the two preferred forms press Cheney's lips, the priceless two-worder, the verb, you. Do I have to expound any further on that? Um, or the more expansive three-worder, a director, directive that begins with the word go. Charles says, though I'm, I myself am partial to the longer version, I admit that each formulation has its virtues. The two-worder is the preferred usage when time is short. And precision is of the essence. That's why it's such a favorite of major league managers. But according to the Post Cheney, the Post Cheney employed the more formal yourself, F yourself. The day before first reports of Cheney's Al, Al alleged indiscretion, Al Gore, who's one of his favorites, delivered a public speech in which he spoke of the administration's establishing a Bush gulag. The former vice president compared the current president to Hitler and Stalin. This was a first, never ever used in hyperbole. In the face of Gore's real beach, 
breach of civil political discourse, which of the following do you think is the right corrective? A, to offer a reason refutation of the change that George Bush is both a Stalinist and a Hitleranian. B, suggest an increase in Gore's medication. Or C, do a Cheney. The correct answer, in my opinion, is C, and given the circumstances, go for the two-word approach. Immigration. Charles said, this deal has been waiting for years and years. Let's hear what he has to say. He's back in our bureau. Charles, I want to start with kind of the breaking news that we heard today. The president saying that the time is right, he thinks, for immigration legislation as long as both sides are willing to compromise. What do you make of that? I think that is huge news. That means that we can interpret all of this over-the-top stuff coming from the president on immigration from the day he announced the Mexican rapist speech as setting up a negotiation. If this is what he wants to do, he is the man who can do it. This is a Nixon to China kind of proposition, a guy who's been his hard line, has been accused of just about everything, talked about, um, you know, the border uh, enforcement with uh, people going around in trucks deporting people. If this president proposes, and you can see from his earlier indication when it comes to the dreamers, the young people brought here as children, he wants to legalize them. That would be the starting point. And then you get to the point, what do you do with the others who are not criminals? The deal has been waiting now for years and years. The Republicans would offer that, which is an enormous concession but only if the Democrats support airtight, strong border security. And that means not just a fence or a wall or border security at the border, but things like a system to verify citizenship inside the country and a visa tracking program. If you get that, you can get a national consensus and put the immigration issue behind us. So this, this may be where I lose a few of you, but I wanted to share with you Charles' take on, um, on the wall, provided I can find it. This essay is called First the Wall, Then Amnesty. Every sensible immigration policy has two objectives that must be followed. Number one, regain control of the borders so that you can decide who enters. And number two, to find a way to normalize and legalize the situation of millions of illegals among us. Those who think employer sanctions will control immigration are dreaming. They are not only useless, they turn employers into enforcers of border control. That is the job of government, not landscapers. As kind of a business guy, I kind of get that. I mean, for me to try to figure out who's in here illegally or not, you hear people talk about that all the time. Well, if we just get all the employers to do our job for us, it will be so easy. It would be really hard. My proposition is the following. A vast number of Americans who oppose legalization and fear new waves of immigration would change their minds if we could radically reduce future illegal immigration. Forget employer standards. We need to build a barrier. It is simply ridiculous to say that it cannot be done. Can't be done. Is Israel's border fence has been extraordinarily successful in keeping inf infiltrators out. Nor, nor, how many North Koreans have you ever heard of that have crossed into South Korea in the last 50 years? Of course it will be ugly. But sometimes necessity trumps aesthetics. When you build a wall to keep people out, this is an expression of sovereignty. It's a perfect legitimate expression of your desire to control who comes into your house to eat, sleep, and use the facilities. No barrier will be foolproof. This is not time for a mushy compromise. A solution requires two acts of national will, the ugly act of putting up the wall and the supremely generous act of absorbing ultimately full citizens those who broke laws to come to America. 
This is not a compromise meant to appease both sides without achieving anything. It's not some piece of hybrid legislation. This is full amnesty earned with back taxes and leaning English and the like with full border control. If we do it right, not only do we solve the problem, but we also get one nation. Now, this is the public comment part. What do you think about that? Anybody have any thoughts that they want to share? Anybody have any thoughts? Would you accept if they said we're going to build a wall? Would you agree? Would you be willing to um, give the 13 or however many million people amnesty over some period of time? I know you all have thoughts, so put your hand up and let's talk about it for a minute. Who's got a thought? Uh -oh. Remember, say what you say what you think right down here. I think amnesty has. I I think that amnesty has to go with some other conditions, not just amnesty. Uh, for instance, uh, the right to vote. Uh, people who have broken the law maybe should never. They might have amnesty, but they may never. Uh, be full citizens, uh, for instance. And <clears throat> another one is, um, let's see, uh, I'm, I had a thought, maybe it'll come back to me. Let's hear a couple other people. Who, who else have, has a thought? Would you take the deal? What do you guys think? Tell me. Who's got a thought? Nita does in the back. We'll get to you in a minute. Um, yeah, I would take the deal, but there, what uh, Georgia, I think, was talking, just said that there would have to be some conditions on who got the amnesty. That, to me, would determine whether I would take the deal or not. Thank you. We've got one more here, and Betty, then we're going to keep going. We've got a lot to cover tonight. Amnesty really, really bugs me. My, my grandmother, my great-grandmother, my aunt, and five children came to this country after the Second World War. They had no men. They, they became citizens, they all worked, they learned the language, and <sighs> amnesty really gets me. It's hard. It's, I, you know, I mean, obviously we need to do something with these people, but <sighs> I don't think we should just roll over and Wait. give them amnesty. I think it should be tough on them because it was tough on people, everybody else, the Japanese people, everybody who came here and became citizens, learned the language, not the language was tailored to them. They learned English. They wanted to become Americans and they considered themselves Americans from the minute they stepped on this land. Um. I included this passage because I wanted you to think about it because I didn't think it would be a lot of people's favorite position. Um, but I kind of see his, where he's going here in that if we don't do something, um, what are we going to have? How many more million are we going to have? 30 million, 40 million? I don't know for sure. Um, but it's an interesting thought. Let's keep, we got one last, one last comment and we're going to keep moving. We got lots to get through tonight. Well, I kind of agreed with the previous uh, lady. My father came from Lebanon back in the 20s or 30s, and he opened up a barber shop in Cincinnati on uh, Vine and Sycamore Street. And he didn't want to be a Lebanese. He didn't want to just join the Lebanese community and stay with them and be stuck. He branched out and he became, he had so many friends, and he even became a, a uh, in the Irish uh, club, whatever, but he really wanted to be an American, and he really wanted um, to be like them, basically. Thank you. you. Know. And when we get so to- So I really think when you get this group coming, if there are coming, with the groups that are here, they do stick together. They don't branch out to get to know what is really our country about. And I, they, well, that's all. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. And when we get to, and we can talk more about it at the end of the, end of the session, 
But when we get to kind of our lightning round where I'm gonna just talk about four or five things that he believed, one of the things he really, really believed was the absolute necessity of any immigrant being able to speak English. No English, no, no immigration, no, no English, no citizenship. If you can't understand the word, if you can't understand the word president, vice president, county commissioner, you can't be a citizen. Um, so how about healthcare? What did Charles think about healthcare? And I want you really quick just to think in your mind what you think should be done on healthcare because I'm pretty sure the first thing he tells you is not gonna be what you think about, I think. So if you had absolute power, what would you do to improve American health care? Charles Krauthammer is the perfect man to ask that question of. He's an author and a columnist. He's also a physician. He went to Harvard Medical School. And so he joins us now to explain what we should do in a perfect world. I think the first thing is to recognize a mistake that Obama made and others have made in thinking that you can revolutionize a system is unbelievably complex yes. and interlinked as medicine, one-sixth of the economy. That was a mistake because whenever you change one thing, it changes 80 other things. And now if you're changing everything at once, you have no idea what the outcome is going to be and you get all these unintended side effects. So I think what you need, first of all, is modesty. And I think it should modesty. be Modesty? Yes, I know it's uh, <laughs> that's a commodity you really can't even purchase in Washington. It's but true. It is available in other parts of the world. Uh, monasteries, for example. Where was I? Okay, the first thing you do is you say, we're going to go at this piece by piece. Yes. The first one that is the biggest, lowest hanging fruit, and that was not even touched by Obamacare, scandalously, is tort reform. The medical malpractice system is totally out of control. Everybody in the system knows it. And it's not just the outrageous judgments. It's not just the fact that some people get millions of dollars, others get nothing, and the one people who get rich are lawyers. It's that it causes doctors to practice defensive medicine. Yes. There was a survey done by the Massachusetts Medical Society that found that doctors admitted that about one quarter of all procedures, examinations, hospitalizations, and tests were done to fend off the lawyers, not for medical reasons. I know that. I was there. I did the same thing. You had to do it. If you were working in a hospital, somebody said just... In, in passing that he had some uh, pain near his chest, you kept him overnight, because otherwise the lawyers would kill you if something happened. Whereas if you were doing it on medical reasons, you might observe him for a couple of hours and send him home. Because there's a cost to staying overnight, not just there, economic. The costs are stuff. massive. Yeah. If one quarter of procedures and tests are done for reasons of legal reasons and not medical reasons, we're talking tens, hundreds of billions of dollars a year. It could be up to half a trillion dollars a year. Imagine if you cut that in half with a rational tort reform system. You could use that money to subsidize the health insurance for every poor person in America. This is just one of the, and the only reason the Democrats did not include it in a bill of 2,000 pages was because they are owned by the trial lawyer. Go to their single biggest donors. Go to any yacht basin in the Caribbean and ask what percentage of the yachts are owned by trial lawyers. It'll be over 10 percent. And a lot of that is sucked out of medicine. Yes. Now that's a really good point. So that's the first thing you would do yeah. is be meaningful tort reform. When I went to, to school, the smart kids either went to medicine or law. The smartest are the ones who went into law because they made the laws that have essentially taxed and stolen the income of the doctors and ends up in, in the legal profession. That's number one, tort reform. And it can be done as a piece. It doesn't have to be done as part of the world right. comprehensive. Second, this is obvious and easy and a lot shorter, is allow people to buy health insurance across state lines. It's now a state issue. It's not rational. You, you, you can buy auto insurance across state lines. What's the opposition to that rooted in? I really don't. I've never heard a very good argument. It could be that the legal structure right now is that health insurance is the province of each state. Right. So that if you open, look, I'm making a case for something I don't believe. If you opened it up, there would be a, what they call a race to the bottom. People would want the cheapest insurance. Well, I would say, what the hell? Why not allow them to buy the insurance they want? Isn't this a free country with auto insurance? You buy whatever level of insurance you want. So that would be the obvious and the, and the second one. 
Uh, and the, the other thing I would do is this is a little complicated. I'm about to go into the Governor Perry territory, or I forget the third, but I do remember the third. And that is, you've got to recognize that you can't make the young and the healthy subsidize the rich by stealth. That's what Obamacare right. did. They hiked up the premiums for the young and the healthy, which by the normal actuarial tables, they'd be paying a sixth of what the elderly do. They ended up, the Democrats had decreed it would be only a third. So they were paying twice what they were getting. So what does a, a rational young person do? Opt out. It, opt out, exactly. And they What's left? Only the sick and the poor, and the system is in collapse. The government has to say, we're going to take care of the very sick, establish an open, transparent government role, and then have the rest of the market open to the healthier people, and their premiums will be kept low. That's the way to do it. Nobody wanted to do it. Obama wanted to hide it, hide the cost, but the young people aren't stupid, and no, they didn't not. buy it. No, and they acted rationally. Trump back on. I'm good. Thanks. Can you imagine the number of procedures that are done just because they can be done so that lawyers uh, won't sue them? The other parallel I'll make to Charles, um, about five years ago or so, we've got a lot of young people here. You know, we manufacture. Manufacturing's hard. It's hard to, to make money manufacturing. Um, I've got a, young, a lot of young employees here. About five or seven years ago, we offered them health insurance, a single a single guy, a single girl that was 24, 25, could buy health insurance for 23 to 25 dollars a pay period, very affordable. They thought it was worth it to spend that much money to be covered. But then all the bean counters, all the healthcare people, all those people came in and they said, "Well, what you got to do, young guys, is you got to cover all the people like me. You know, you got to we got to charge you more." to cover everybody else. And so what all the young guys do, they said, well, instead of $23 a pay period, it's gonna be $150 a pay period. And that's three nights not being able to go out and drink beer on a Friday night. And what do you think they decided to do? They decided not to get health care. And why shouldn't a young person be able to buy whatever health care they need if, they're, if only a very few of them are gonna get sick? Why should they be charged the way they are? I feel bad whenever I, bring out the insurance policies to them because I think they're getting a kind of a, a bad deal. Um, but I thought his take on healthcare was just so right on. Um, so this is kind of a selfish essay I'll share with you um, called Be Afraid. Charles was a huge chess player, um, loved chess. And this goes back to the days when Gary Kasparov, the world famous chess player, was playing the computer called Big Blue. Um, on February 10th, Gary Kasparov, the best chess player in the world, and quite possibly the best chess player who ever lived, sat down across a chessboard from a machine IBM called Deep Blue, and he lost. It's true, we've created machines that can run faster, lift better, see further than we can. Thinking is our specialty, or so we think, we humans think. How could a device capable of nothing more than calculations and scoring possibly beat a human being like us with a lifetime of experience, instant pattern recognition, and a killer instinct? How? Deep Blue is seeing 200 million positions every second. You and I see one. Kasparov sees maybe two. It was style versus power and power one. The machine has no fear. Big Blue was calculating every possible combination of moves and determining with absolute certainty that it could return from its pawn picking expedition and destroy Kasparov, which it did. It takes more than nerves of steel to do that. It takes a silicone brain. No human can ever achieve absolute certainty because no human can be sure it has seen everything. Deep Blue can. 
My son, who was 10, who lives comfortably with his computer, as he does with his dog, was rooting for Deep Blue all along. He said, hey, Dad, what are you worried about? My son said, after all, we made the machine, didn't we? So we're just beating ourselves, right? I realized at that moment that the next generation has already gone over to them and Deep Blue. No need to wait for the rematch. It's over. Um, that's kind of a futuristic look of, uh, of, um, of where we're going. Um, and uh, should we be afraid of that? I don't know. Let's, Charles, those of you who watched him, you always knew where he was on the subject, and he sure had eight years to talk about um, Obama. I thought it would be unfair for me not to let you share in just a couple of his thoughts. This, he talks about Obama and his intellectual dishonesty. Charles, great to see you. Uh, so the president, the president, whether he acknowledges it explicitly, was dealt a significant blow today by this high court. Yes, and it's not the first time. This is the culmination of a long string of decisions issued by the Supreme Court and by lower courts, which have admonished this president for clearly overstepping the boundaries of his authority. In this case, it was quite egregious. And that's what the Fifth Circuit had said. This was a sweeping decision that would have empowered uh, these illegal immigrants. And whether you agree with the policy or not, it was simply not in the president's power to do it. And just because the president wants to do something that Congress will not do, it does not give him the authority to do it. I mean, he doesn't, exactly he doesn't as seem in to this get case. that. He doesn't seem to get no, that. He he 22 right. times, 22 times he came out and said to the community pushing for immigration reform, I can't. I've done all I can do. If, you, if I take the next step, which is the thing that just got struck down today, I'll be overstepping my authority. I'm not a king. And then he did it and never, ever explained how he found the authority that he'd been saying for months he lacked. Well, I, I agree with you. That was astonishingly intellectually dishonest. I'll follow up with probably one of Charles' favorite um, essays that you've probably heard before called, um, you remember when uh, President Obama came out and said that, um, raised the question of, did the state make you great? You might have heard President Obama say, if you've got a business, you didn't build it. Someone else made that business happen. I say the most formative, most important influence on the individual is not government. It's civil society. Those elements of collectivity that lie outside of government, things like family, neighborhood, church, the Rotary Club, the PTA, the voluntary associations that Tocqueville understood to be the real genius of America. Moreover, the greatest threat to the robust civil society is the ever-growing Leviathan state, the government, and those like Obama who see it as the ultimate expression of their collective. Obama compounds the fallacy by declaring the state to be the font of entrepreneurial success. How so? Because it created the infrastructure, the roads, the bridges, the schools, the internet off which we all thrive. That is absurd. We don't credit the Swiss Postal Service with Einstein's special theory of relativity because they mailed Einstein's manuscript to the world. Everybody drives the roads. Everybody goes to school and uses the mails. So did Steve Jobs. Yet only he created the Mac and the iPad. The ultimate Obama fallacy is that the belief in the value of in infrastructure is what divides liberals from conservatives. Limited government is what drives the difference as it encourages and celebrates character, independence, energy, hard work as the foundation of a free society and a thriving economy. That's what makes us great. Historical figures, how are they judged?
Let me ask you a question. Uh, in San Francisco now, uh, one of the school board uh, guys is thinking about taking George Washington's name off a high school in the city because Washington was a slave owner. Okay? So those of us who understand who George Washington was and, and how heroic he was in the forming of this nation, we have to defend Washington. How do you do it? Oh, I would just ignore anyone that's stupid. I mean, the idea that we're going to apply the historical norms of 250 years later to every person in history uh, and to find them wanting, as we always will, it's kind of a presentism where the present is far better than the past and everybody in it is condemned is simply appalling. But then slave owning, left. slave owning, that's big. Um, you know, that's, that's a stigma attached to Washington. Um, you can't justify the owning of slavery, even though it was, as you said, the norm back then, can you? It, but we're not justifying it. What you're saying is everybody historically has to be judged by their historical context, by the world they are living in, and the way we see the world clearly. I mean, there are all kinds of things beyond slavery. I think in a hundred years, people are going to judge us as a civilization that killed wantonly and ate animals. And w there's going to be a time where we're not going to need to do that, and we're going to end up judging them. Our, they're they're going to end up judging their ancestors, meaning us harshly for having, you know, been that wanton and that uh, cruel. There are all kinds of things. Slavery is, yes, that's at the sort of the edge of the scale of the most uh, cruel and impossible to justify. But the point is that if you apply that, then there's nothing in history. No, there isn't anything in history. But it, that, that's and there's a tough nobody one. who can be respected. That's a tough one. died died in a California gas chamber. California's first, this was California's first execution in 25 years. There's no doubt Harris deserved to die, but in my view, California should not have killed him. Not because there's anything unconstitutional about the death penalty. The Fifth Amendment takes it as a given. It may be cruel, but it isn't unusual. Any measure which 36 states approve cannot be deemed unusual. I do not oppose capital punishment in principle. If capital punishment could be demonstrated to deter murder, I might be persuaded to tolerate a few hangings to save many innocents. But there's no convincing evidence that the death penalty deters anything. Murder rates in states with the death penalty are just as high as in neighboring states without it. Those who oppose capital punishment need not do so in the name of the state taking away life or liberty, but on the grounds that an advanced civilized society should strive to perceive, preserve public order and social peace with an absolute minimum of official violence to life and liberty. Someday, some emergency might warrant the state aggressively hanging criminals and gagging dissidents, but until that day, it would be a credit to our society to try and get by without the noose and without the gag. You can tell me what you think about that in a little while. This was right around the time Charles bowed out of the public view when the first kind of example of um, disrespecting the national anthem came up. So I was interested in his take. I'm more interested in what he says um, in the clip about education. Thanks for staying with us. I'm Bill O'Reilly in the personal story segment tonight, disrespecting the national anthem on the 15th anniversary of the 9-11 attack. Four Miami Dolphins players mimicking Colin Kaepernick knelt during the national anthem yesterday. Also, Kansas City Chief Marcus Peters gave the black power salute during the anthem. Obviously, both actions disrespectful, especially yesterday. In addition, kids are seeing the display and some are starting to ape it. 
For example, some football players at Woodrow Wilson High School in Camden, New Jersey, did not rise for the national anthem. Same thing happened in Nebraska, Kentucky, Virginia, in Illinois. The tragedy of this is that it is based upon a false premise. The Black Lives Matter assertion that young black American males are actively being hunted by police. Right now I'm reading a book called Blue on Blue by the former head of the New York City Police Internal Affairs Division, Charles Campisi, who puts forth a stunning statistic, quote, in a city of 8.4 million people, NYPD officers shot and killed eight people in 2013, all males, all of whom were carrying guns or knives, seven of whom had criminal histories, and one who had a history of violent psychiatric problems. Yes, that's eight dead people short of perfect, unquote. It's amazing. To be fair, there's another component to the protest, social justice. Some Americans believe the USA, not a fair society. Join us in Washington, Charles Krauthammer. So let's take the disrespect first. You see a problem on 9-11 with the black power thing and the kneeling? I see a problem whether, whether it's 9-11 or not. It is an active form of disrespect, and that's the reason they do it, as a way to get attention and as a way they think to express their protest. Um, you know, and there's a reason I think that you get some imitation from kids in high school is because the current educational system, the current history textbooks, are basically catalogs of the pathologies of American history. They're all about the racism, sexism, xenophobia, all of the sins of the fathers cataloged and that's what a younger generation is being taught. I'm amazed that there isn't a more of this. I do think, however, that it is relatively benign in the sense that if this is the worst of the dissent, if this is the worst of the expressions of anti-Americanism, then I think the country is doing rather well. But it Gun control. What did Charles think about that on another day when we had another big problem? Charles says, I have no problem in principle with gun control. Congress enacted and I supported an assault weapons ban in 1994. The problem was it didn't work. And this morning, the very first thing my wife said to me when, I, when we woke up was um, another gun incident. We've got to have gun control. And I was been reading this and I thought, should I tell my wife the problem was it didn't work? Without disarming the entire citizenry and repealing the Second Amendment, it's almost impossible to craft a law that would be effective. If we're serious about curtailing future Columbines and new towns, everything, guns, commitment of the mentally ill people and culture must also be on the table. It's not hard for President Obama to call out the NRA like he does on every incident like this, but will he call out the ACLU? Will he call out his Hollywood friends? The irony is that over the last 30 years, the, this, this was amazing to me, the irony is that over the last 30 years, the U.S. homicide rate has, dot, has declined by 50%. Gun murders as well. We're living not through an epidemic of gun violence, but through a historic decline. But there's a cost. Gun control impinges upon the Second Amendment. Involuntary, involuntary commitment impinges upon the Liberty Clause of the Fifth Amendment. Curbing entertainment violence impinges upon the Fifth Amendment of free speech. That's a lot of impingement, a lot of amendments. But there is no free lunch. Increasing public safety almost always means restricting and taking away liberties. We made that trade after 9-11. We make it every time the TSA invades your body at the airport. How much are we prepared to trade away to do away with these massacres? Good question. What did Charles say about Reagan? Barack Obama once said something that I think is the least quoted of his remarks and probably the most important. He said this during the 2008 campaign and he said, Ronald Reagan was a historically consequential president in a way that a Bill Clinton was not. 
Now, in part, that was to enrage the Clintons, which is understandable, but in part, it was profoundly true. And what he meant is that Reagan did something extremely unusual in American history. What Reagan did is to alter the ideological trajectory of the country. If you look back on it, and this is probably the one thing on which I would agree with Barack Obama, there aren't a lot of others. And I mean when I say, period. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. It's... If you look at the ideological trajectory of the United States, you would have to say that there was a 50-year liberal ascendancy. It begins with FDR, with the New Deal, and an ascendancy doesn't just mean that you get into power, you enact your agenda. What it means is that when you inevitably lose power, because we have a rotation of power in our system, the other guys, they come in and they retain what you did. They don't roll it back. So for 20 years, conservatives railed against the New Deal, but then a conservative is elected president, Eisenhower in 53, and even after all the reigning, they do not repeal it stays in place. Then you get a second burst of liberalism with Kennedy Johnson, the Great Society, and Nixon comes into office. He not only accepts the premises of the Great Society, but he expands it. He's the one who created the EPA. He's the one who gave the teeth to the EEOC. He essentially institutionalized affirmative action. That defines an ideological ascendancy. And that's a 50-year arc until January 20th, 1981, Ronald Reagan is sworn into office, and within 10 minutes, he says in his inaugural address, government is not the solution, government is the problem. I see all of you had your insurance canceled this week. <laughs> Great crowd, I can't lose in this crowd. Reagan attacks and refutes and rejects the central idea of the 50-year liberal ascendancy. And then he proceeds to have a presidency so successful that he brings the country along. So that when Republicans inevitably lose office and a Clinton comes into office, what happens? Clinton declares in his 1996 State of the Union address the era of big government is over, and by the end of the year, he signs a bill abolishing welfare. That shows that this conservative ideology that Reagan inaugurated, that had become the zeitgeist, the norm in the country, and it carried over for 30 years. 30-year swing, that's the kind of thing that happens with a great leader. What did he say about another leader? I found this one really interesting. Um, and this one is called The Inner Man. 161, I hope I can find that. 161, this is called The Inner Man Who Cares. We've all had a great chuckle listening to Richard Nixon and the tapes over the years. More tapes, more titillation, more notable his ranting and his raving about Jews. First, I wonder how anyone would fare if they had to have an open microphone in their office for 3,700 hours running. Second, Nixon, Nixon was suspicious and paranoid about everyone. So what else is new? Third and most important, I don't really care what a public figure thinks. I care about what he does. Let God probe his inner heart. Tell me about his outer acts. Even Nixon, his private thoughts spilled out on tape, however, is no open book. Sure, the seething cauldron of hatred and fear helps explain Watergate. But how do you match that with the man who cut through the paranoia and fear and opened the door to China? He fashioned detente. He ushered in the air of arms control, something less psych psychically royal presidents have not been able to do. I encourage you to know thyself. 
It's a highly overrated piece of wisdom. As for knowing the self of others, forget it. Know what they do and judge people by their works. It's good advice. Moving on to Trump. What did Charles have to say about Trump's election? Um, if it continues and Trump wins, this is an ideological and electoral revolution of the kind we haven't seen since Reagan. What this means ideologically is that the Republican Party has become a populist party and the country is going to be without a classically conservative party. What Trump has done is, is not just to awaken the white working class, but to win it back. These were the Reagan Democrats. They drifted away and he brings them back. Now, what's interesting is he brings them back on issues he says of the cause of their misery is immigration and trade, which you don't see getting a lot of support. I think the reason he got them back is he simply said, I'm your voice. I hear what you're saying. And what this is, this is part of the worldwide the Brexit revolution of the, these countries in the West understanding that globalization and the advances that we get from this new economy, the information economy, have brought tremendous benefits, but no one has addressed the needs of those who are the net losers. Net globalization trade is always a positive, but net means there are winners and losers. Right. And Trump is a guy who understood that. He's spoken to those who've lost out. He said, I speak for you. I don't know whether his remedies are going to work, but certainly what we're seeing is an ideological shift, speaking for the white working class, and also the non-white working class. And it's going to be an electoral shift because that means that the old Rust Belt is now in play permanently for Republicans. As, and on the other hand, with the rise of Hispanic registration, Hispanic voting, the classically southern states for Republicans are no longer that classically safe. Mm -hmm. Charles was not a big Trump fan in the beginning, but did warm to some of his positions. Um, we won't be able to talk about his, what he thought was Trump's favorite speech because we're running a little shy on time. But it, his, uh, Charles' favorite speech that Trump ever gave was when Trump was in Poland. Um, his views on affirmative action, I'm not going to be able to read them. Um, but Charles had a great take on affirmative action, which is something the Supreme Court decided. The Supreme Court decided that the state of Michigan, University of Michigan, could basically allow discrimination. And Charles' view on that whole thing was, we the people have the power to decide how we want to look at affirmative action. But because our legislators won't make any decisions, we get what we deserve. And I think that's a good lesson. Uh, on the speed round, just a couple last things. I'm not going to read to you, but I thought you'd be interested in knowing about what Charles thought about. How many of you are aware that the city of Cincinnati changed Columbus Day to Indigenous People Day? Charles' views on that subject were extremely straightforward. If we are to judge civilizations like individuals that should all be hanged, because with individuals it takes but one murder to merit a hanging, but if one judges civilizations by what they have taken away and what they've given to the world, then I would surely bless the day that Christopher Columbus sailed. Uh, in plain English, I think I've already gone over that with you, Charles said, to be a citizen, you must be able to understand those words. Farewell, New Frontier. One of the things Charles hated most was doing away with the space program. He thought if we couldn't invest in our own space program, then there's no way that we could keep up technologically with the rest of the world. On Social Security, he had an interesting take. He said, sure, it is a Ponzi scheme, but he said, it is also the most vital, humane, and fixable of all social programs. The question for the candidates is, forget Ponzi, are you going to fix Social Security? This was an interesting one to me, stem cells and fairy tales. He had a lot to say about stem cell technology because he was paralyzed. Who better to um, 
when, but he especially spoke about John Kerry and John Edwards, who, who really talked about stem cell technology as part of their platform. He said, it's false hope. It's impossible to do. It won't work. It's light years away. Um, this is from a guy who would know. Judging Israel, Charles was Jewish. His point was simple. Any moral judgment must take into the account that Israel cannot stand alone. And if it is abandoned by friends for not meeting Western standards of morality, it will die. Finally, on the issue of hyper, hyper proliferation, I think he changed my idea. We're now in a dawn of which extreme and fanatical religious ide ideology exists. And um, that is why Iran arriving at the threshold of nuclear weaponry is such a significant historical moment. It is not just the president says crazy things about the Holocaust. President Mohammad Ahmadinejad has reportedly said at official meetings that the end of history is only two to three years away. When he spoke at the UN, the president of Iran said he felt a halo around his head for 27 to 28 minutes. Our planet is 4.5 billion years old, and we've had nukes for exactly 61. No one knows the precise prospects for human extinction. He was very worried about that. As Charles' medical condition worsened, he disappeared from the public in late 2017 and 2018. In June of 2018, he released the following letter. I, I'm, I, I'm not going to be able to to you for the sake of time, but it was an amazing letter. Did most of you get a chance to read that when it came out, where he talked about his condition? Um, but what I really want to say that I'm sad to leave basically this planet, but I leave with the knowledge that I lived the life I have intended. How many of you, how many of us wish we could say that when we are prepared to die? I'll get you, I'll post a copy of that letter online. It's really something. So I've got a couple of eulogies I, I just wanted to let you hear about his life, and then we'll finish up. So I can't speak for their memories. Allow me now to speak for mine. Fewer, but just as powerful. Not as personal, but for me, very, very personal. You see, when it came to Charles, I wasn't just a viewer. I have to admit, I was a voyeur. That's what we in this industry do. We watch others who do what we do, especially those who are really good at what we do or should do. You see, Charles was really good at what he did. But what amazed me was how he did it. I marveled at his manner, but more, I marveled at his manners. He never screamed. He never yelled. He never impugned the integrity of anyone. Yet he won the respect of everyone. No drama, just decency. No zingers for the other side, just a zeal that impressed both sides. He was thoughtful and measured, respectful and kind. He got your attention because he got life, maybe because he got the fragility of life in a way most conservatives could not and cannot. And most liberals insist they are, but are not. That was the Charles Krauthammer I knew. And you know, that was good enough for me. That was inspiring enough for me that it was possible to make a point without morphing into a shout fest that turned pointless. That was his secret. He had no secrets. That was his game. He played no games. You know, everyone's been saying what you saw is what you got with Charles. A man who had been through so much, which you wouldn't know it unless you asked. And he wouldn't tell you much, even if you pushed. It is how he handled the things that went well, just like the things that did not. He was just dealing with the cards he was dealt. And that's all you really needed to know, so just deal. The man who refused to be defined by the legs he couldn't use, but the remarkable brain he could and did. Brit Hume said Charles was an unlikely media megastar. I think it's his unlikeliness that made him a media megastar. He spoke volumes, sometimes without speaking much at all. The quiet man at the table who ruled that table. And now, like you, all I can focus on is the empty space at that table. And the silence is deafening. Goodbye, my friend. Good night. Imagine that. 
And finally, here's one last eulogy on his life. Now you've heard the crushing news about our colleague and dear friend Charles Krauthammer. I have only a few weeks left to live, Charles wrote in one of his final letters. This is the final verdict. My fight is over. Well, over the coming days, Charles will be celebrated and ultimately eulogized by those who knew him. For generations, he will continue to touch and guide those who didn't know him. His words, clear and crisp and true, will long outlive him. A lot will be said about Charles Krauthammer. I'd like to add just one thing. Over the more than 20 years that I knew him, Charles thought about death every day. He told me that once. If that sounds morose, it was just the opposite. Because he was one of those rare people with the courage to look reality squarely in the face, Charles radiated a calm cheerfulness. He knew what was coming. He'd been very close to it before. He didn't want to leave, but it didn't scare him. Charles Krauthammer is a genuinely brave man. For that reason, he is a happy man. I live the life that I intended, he wrote, and there is no higher achievement than that. Good night. Have a great weekend. I live the life I intended, and there's no higher achievement than that. Anybody have any position change for many of the things we went over that you'd be willing to share tonight? Any thoughts about Charles? Anybody want to share anything? Right here. We'll take just a couple questions, and then we're going to have to end because we're running a little late. And would you say your first name, please? I don't think it's on, Betty. Do we know, do we have someone to replace him now, you know, his caliber and, and the way he came across and inspired people quietly and, and gave them the knowledge. You know, some people don't have a knowledge of all this government going on and everything. He made it, explained it, and made it simple to understand. I just wonder who is out there. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Or anybody change a position on anything tonight? Ken Bowman, what do you think? You've got a thought on, on everything, right? Your thoughts are escaping you tonight. Anybody else have any thoughts? Right back in the back, Nita has a thought. Well, first of all, Dan, I just really want to thank you for putting this together. I think this was one of the most amazing presentations I've ever seen. Thank just, you, thank you. <laughs> When you said you were going to do this, I was just, I didn't know how you could do it. Charles Krauthammer wrote so much. How do you go through all that and how do you pick out what he's done? And just what you picked out is just perfect. And I, I just really think the man was amazing and it was a hard job that you did and you did a great job. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, I was so taken by the indispensability of Winston Churchill. That's going to be hopefully my class that I'm going to be teaching in the uh, spring because um, I know so little about him other than the Dunkirk moments and um, a few other things that I know I'm excited to learn about him. Anybody else have a, a last minute thought? Yes, right here in front. We've got two and then we're, we're gonna be done. One and two. It just makes me go home and really think about what's important in my life and what is not. I really think I learned a lot. That's what I feel. And to say what's on your mind. Yes. Oh, yes. And right here. Right there. Right. To my husband right now. <laughs> my name is Bob. Uh, one of the big things that I'm thinking about here is the way he talked about the death penalty and it really wasn't a deterrent. And it may change my mind on a lot of things, but uh, I think that that's a great point you made because that's one of the ones where I've just been always in my mind so much for it, so much for it, so much for it. But when you think about hanging people and, um, and you know, having people take a, a pill and things like that, it, are we, do we need to, to do that? And I, that's one of the ones that got me too. So thanks for bringing that up. Um, I really want to thank you for joining me tonight. Kind of, um, as we lived uh, through Charles' life. And I just wanted to let you know, three last classes to go. The Roebling Suspension Bridge on Tuesday night, 
on Thursday night of next week, we've got, oh my goodness, my friend Michael Patton talking about the electrical grid and what happens if somebody takes out a transformer and how long you'll be out of uh, electricity and the internet for. And then uh, finally, Abraham Lincoln. Thank you so much for coming. Good night.